Good evening and welcome. My name is Helen Reid and I'm Director of Leeds Church Institute. Our vision is learning for a faithful city. Uh, at Leeds Church Institute we love Leeds and at the same time believe it should be a better place for all people to live. And so our work is to support people, churches and organisations to learn more about how to make change happen. And that's why we're really pleased to host this book launch tonight. This is the book, Understanding and Managing Sophisticated and Everyday Racism, Implications for Work and Education and Work. It's by Victoria Shanumi and Carol Tomlin and published by Lexington Books. I think this is a book that people in Leeds need to read because we need greater understanding of the different forms of racism and better insight into how to identify them and to respond and challenge. This book is clear and honest and caring. It's analytical and practical. When I read it, I felt I learnt a lot and I'm going to start by recommending it to you. Start that at the very beginning of the evening. It's wonderful that you've come here this evening to meet the authors and hear about the book. Now, unfortunately, we have heard from quite a few people that they're unable to make the date. Um, so the good news is it's been filmed and it will be on YouTube by the end of the week on our channel, Leeds Church Institute, LCI. Please recommend it. One person who had to send her, send her apologies is Beverly Adams, who is the Principal Community Engagement Officer for West Yorkshire Police. And she sent you a special message to say her apologies, she's unable to attend, send you her best wishes for a successful event. The plan for this evening is that Victoria and Carol will speak about the book and their perspective, and then Reverend Dr. Erickson McFumo will offer a response to the book. After that, Dawn, who's representing Lexington Books, will make you all a special offer on buying your own copy of the book. And there'll be time at the end to get your book signed and for an informal conversation with the authors. So to formally introduce the authors, Dr. Victoria Shumley is Associate Professor at University College London in the Institute of Education. Victoria's work has both research and educational strengths. In research, Victoria has a national and international reputation for her work on identity and leadership, particularly on the themes of gender identity and race in the context of leadership. In her teaching, Victoria has pioneered developing understanding of the student experience and is module leader for sociology and race. <coughs> Reverend Dr. Carol Tomlin is an academic and a spiritual leader. Carol is a visiting fellow at the University of Leeds in the School of Philosophy, Religion and History of Science. She's also pastor with Restoration Fellowship Ministries. And as founding director of Kingdom School of Theology, her educational expertise joins with her faith commitment. Carol has published extensively in the fields of education, faith, identity and linguistics. It's my pleasure to welcome you both, and please do join me in welcoming Victoria. <laughs> so I have a few questions for you. And I'd like to start by asking about the motivation for the book. There are many books written about race. How is this book different from other books on racism? Okay, there were several books, as you've said, written on race. Um, and if I can just to put it in context, cite a few. Um, so, for example, there um, is a book by Susan Cousin, um, Overcoming Racism. Um, but that book is a practical guide. Um, there's another book by Mirza, Heidi Mirza, let's get her name mixed up, um, and <coughs> Bafi, Barney, um, that's her surname, and that book is on tackling the roots of racism. Um, that book doesn't deal with strategies and it doesn't really document the struggles that black women in particular experience. Um, and then there are a couple of other books that are aimed at primarily white audiences, um, one by, uh, oh gosh, Lodge, um, and the other 
by uh, Robin D'Angelo. So those two books, um, that one by Robin D'Angelo is on white fragility. And interestingly, both these books are bestsellers, so I would recommend that you buy these books. But they're aimed primarily at white audiences, um, so they're not written for a black audience. Our book, <coughs> um, in many ways, Dove's Tales, all of those books, but we are aiming our book primarily at black female audiences, not excluding the men, of course, <laughs> but black female audiences and also white individuals in power to give them the contextual analysis of racism. So that's where our book is different and it's clearly written by two black female or, um, authors, scholars as well. Would you like to add? Yeah, I'd just add a little bit more, mm. I mean, about the motivation. I mean, it was um, uh, spending time in America mm. and with, with a publisher and everything else, and I, and I got talking to them about my idea, and it was backwards and forwards with what it looked like, and I, and I wanted Carol to be part of the conversation. I, I kind of sat on it for about 18 months beforehand, and so... Through the conversations we had, we had lots of conversations, um, kind of the, the book materialised out of that. So it wasn't kind of the fact of this is what we're going to do. Yeah. Carol was part of the conversation after I'd already decided I wanted to do it. And um, and we wanted it to be, I wanted it to be a kind of a, um, based on understanding a whole range of different things yeah. in relation to being black and a woman. Yeah. So that was really the motivation. And so we could have finished it some time ago, but I think it was really prevalent that it wasn't finished then because it needed to kind of take on all the different aspects because things were unravelling. And the concept of what it is to be black and a woman in different parts of the world, I think that was really important. So I think that's, that's what the motivation, yeah. I, think, I suppose what I'm saying in a nutshell, that it was evolving. Yeah. It was actually quite a long process then. Yeah. Yes, and absolutely. Can I, can I just add, um, with BLM, I think the book as well is extremely timely. So it came within that event and that episode. So um, I think that perhaps motivated us even more, but we were motivated before then. But we felt that the book would really be a good platform to open the discussion and to provide the critical conversations and analysis as well. I'd like to um, ask a question about the first chapter now. Uh, so the first chapter contextualises the discuss discussion of race and the word racisms is written in the plural form. Why did you choose that form? Okay, right. The reason why we chose that particular form to pluralise racism is because there are different types of racisms, plural, aimed at different types of people. So, for example, you have racism against refugees. That's one example. You have racism against different people of different nationalities um, and obviously brown people as well. But the racism, and sorry, just going back, you also have anti-Semitism, which dovetails with racism. And interestingly, racism wasn't just based on skin colour. If we look at um, Irish, the Irish population, for example, who were in America, um, Ignatius, sorry, Noel Ignatius writes a book about how the Irish became white. And so the same caricatures, for example, that you see historically with black people in terms of the ape-like image protruding mouth that was also presented where Irish people were concerned did you were you aware of that yeah not many people were aware so that is interesting um, and again there were similar images that were presented with Jews but the racism that is different is anti-blackness and we we said that unlike the others, anti-blackness is definitely a global phenomenon and it in some ways knocks 
class and gender out of the equation, anti-blackness is the most predominant feature of racism. Um, and so, hence, the reason why we pluralised the term racism to racisms. <coughs> Moving on to the second chapter, The Tangled Web of Blackness, Identity and Race. Uh, can you both talk a little about that aspect? So you focus on the interplay between white women and black women and perhaps talk about how that plays out in the workplace. Yeah, I think, well, this, this is kind of my baby, really, I would yeah. say, and, and I claim that because it's conceptual. Yeah. And um, it's, it's something which goes back to the motivation of why I wanted to do the book in the first place. And it is around the, um, how, um, how white women and black women how that in itself has come about. And so this chapter looks at, and it starts to really have the conversation about plantation and what took place within the plantation house and how that in itself has still got residue. And so what I mean by that, if you've got the, um, so I write in here and I, and I use the metaphor of the big house. And then I start to describe the different players within the big house. But I then also look at that, is how that plays out in the workplace. Now you've all been to the workplace, and I'm thinking about black women sitting in this room here, and also white women as well. You go to the workplace, and you think to yourself, right, okay, here I am as a woman, and I'm going to be um, accepted because I'm a woman, and I know that they do lots of work with gender in this workplace. And so you walk up the steps and you knock on the door, and a white woman opens the door. This is how I kind of start talking about this in the book opens up the door and you can see their face drop because it's a black woman. Now, of course, what happens with that is that they recognise that the resources are now to be shared. Mm. So they're now going to be shared. That There's gender, so the white woman in the workplace is very happy that lots of resources are going to be supported for her. All of a sudden, you are, she's in face-to-face -face with a black woman. And then you think, oh, no, I'm now having to share my space with not just a person who's a woman, but somebody who's black. So this is where the interplay starts coming in. And I go back to kind of unsavory parts of the plantation house and what that meant. When black women were being brutalized by the plantation owner, whether it was the father, uncle, whoever it was. But then of course we talk about this in the book and this chapter where the black men were then left and the white women needed to have their femininities. And so they went, they, they kind of neared towards black men. And so the black men then were the people which were part of white women's kind of needs. So this also starts to interplay with how it all works out within the workplace. Um, it's exciting, it's a very exciting uh, chapter because there are some um, really, I suppose, useful, um, I'm going to see if I can read a little tiny bit, even if it's just a few, a little tiny bit to you, but even if it's just useful in relation to how things turn out, and you might see yourself in this particular way it comes across. And now what I'm going to do, I'm just going to read you a little part. Do you mind me reading something small to you? Mm -hmm. Are you ready for a story? <laughs> okay, all right. Um, I promise it won't take too much time, but um, so... This here, I've just set a little tiny bit of the scene. And, so, and there's also diagrams in the book as well. So what I've said is from the big house to the workplace and patterns persist. Now, you're going to have to just kind of go with me for a little while and you might want to just kind of note the names I'm going to give you. So the following narrative shows how individuals who embody the roles which emerged originally in the big house still persist today, in today's workplace. The characters in this account with their distinctive typologies are as follows. A key person in the story mirrors the white slave owner. He is Paul, a successful white leader. He recruits an arrogant young white male, High Flyer, who's 35 and his name's Charles. The black supervisors are Karen, 55, and she's a pacifist. Now remember the names, these names are linked to society. Uh, Karen's 55 is a pacifist and Karen just lets things happen and Charles is allocated to Karen's team. Angela 
50 and an activist. Andrew can be described as the activist who creates awareness, carries the billboard and stands up for social justice. Now Stephen is 47, complicit. Stephen empowers a white management because he is prepared to accept or even support the unjust status quo. And then of course Donald, disruptor. Donald creates alternative facts, causes chaos, unheaval and also conflict. And then there's William, 45, who's an ambitious white supervisor. Now let me just tell you the story. Right, story part one. I'm only going to do part one. Sophisticated racism. Paul, 55, is white. He's a, he's a director of a large unit which is doing well under his management. He has a group of eight supervisors who enroll, ensure that all the members of each of their prospective teams focus well on their work to keep up high levels of product productivity. Four of the supervisors are black, I just mentioned them, and the company prides itself on its ethnic diversity and endeavours to give responsibility to black employees. Company leaders often highlight about the company. Paul is proud to have recruited an outstanding young white male, 35 Charles, to the company. Paul is convinced he will do great things and rise rapidly to the top. He sees Charles as a younger vision of himself. He, al he allocates Charles to Cowan's team. Cowan is 55 and one of the best and most experienced supervisors. She is black. Paul has arranged to meet Charles to catch up after his first few weeks. Paul, he says, so how are things going, Charles? Charles says, fine, fine. So Paul says, you don't sound altogether happy. Are you enjoying the work? Is there a problem? And Charles says, well, actually there is. It's a bit awkward, but uh, Paul, Paul says, go on, spill the beans. We're keen that you should be happy here. Charles, I'm not sure. As a matter of fact, it's Karen. I don't think Karen's uh, the right person to be my supervisor. I don't think she's a good fit. We don't understand each other. I get on well with William, though he would be a better fit for my supervisor. Paul, William, He's, he isn't nearly as experienced as Karen. And you know, you know, you know that, don't you? Charles, yes, but you know. Paul, okay. I'll see what you mean. I see what you mean. I'll see what I can do. That's part one. I'm not going to give you part two. <laughs> you can already start to see the storyline there, right? And remember the characters. I'm going to leave that yeah. as that. I hope that gave you a little yeah. taster. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The other, thank you for that, Victoria. Um, and to contextualise that historically again. So Victoria alluded to um, the plantocracy and we spent quite a considerable time in the book um, analysing the whole slavery event. And we then particularly focused on um, the stereotypes of black women historically. Now, historically, black women were presented as Jezebels, hypersexual beings, um, strong. Um, some people talk about the mummification of black women, um, that they are mothers, or in so-called black parlance, we would say the mamas or the big mamas. Um, and so within that historical context, then emerges a typology of the black female. And we're talking about the diasporic context. And by diaspora, I mean those outside of Africa, in the Caribbean, in the UK, black women outside of Africa. And so um, it's really complex. But we then also have what Victoria has called white woman syndrome and the interplay between black women and white women um, and how black men are also configured within that discourse. We focus on colorism and shadism where black 
not just women and men, have internalised racism. Um, and so there is a preference for lighter skin. Um, and so you have to configure that whole racist matrix within the plantocracy system. Because when we look at the plantation and what was going on, the mulattoes, i.e. the lighter skinned blacks, were given certain privileges and um, preferences. And that, unfortunately, is with us today, um, particularly, and not only in the United States. So we do the context. So we say as well that, what do we mean by a black identity? It's complex. So for example, um, Somalians in this country, um, or Ethiopians, we seem to make a distinction when we're talking about Ethiopians as if they're not from Africa, and they are. But the Ethiopians have said, we don't need to say we're black because we're no, we know we're black and we're Africans. So within the context of Ethiopia, for example, that discussion is never had. But the discussions of race to some extent has been informed in this particular context, i.e. Britain, um, by the Windrush generation. That is my parents, I'm giving away my age now, who came over in the post-war period. I know I look good for my age. Um, <laughs> sorry, my humor's coming out. <laughs> um, um, who came to the United Kingdom and it's interesting because individuals like my mother, for example, would use the term Jamaican to describe her identity. So individuals didn't describe themselves by color per se. It was according to the island that they came from, whether it be St. Kitts, Nevis, or Antigua. So they wouldn't necessarily refer to themselves using a color-coded system. Um, in fact, many Jamaicans that I've spoken to said back home, quote unquote, there was colorism, but the race issue wasn't really a big feature of the society. In fact, the motif in, a, in Jamaica is out of many one people. So the identity is a tangled web. It's not straight black and white. Thank you. I'm going to move on now to chapter three, where you explore sophisticated and everyday racism. And that's the central thrust of the book. So Victoria, how would you describe that? Yeah, I th okay, that's, I mean, I think chapter two and chapter three are really kind of fundamental to the book, yeah. actually. And um, sophisticated is a terminology which I've kind of coined because um, I, I grew up in the in the suburbs, so I, not the suburbs, I grew up in the rural part of England, which has started off in Devon and then Somerset, so it is, to me, very rural, and I, mean, I started off in a very small village. And so when I did emerge and come to London, um, and when I was, you know, I, I didn't, also didn't live with my own people, I lived with um, um, white German-Jewish parents, and so when I did come to London um, at a later age, um, it was... Um, when, and um, I used to go to lots of events with, you know, um, black colleagues and friends I got to know. And the, the, I, when I looked at um, racism and I looked at what I grew up with, I felt that London racism is extremely sophisticated, very sophisticated. Um, I, I dealt with rawness of what it was, absolute raw. There was no kind of... Kind of um, I learned certain terminology in relation to people and what they looked like and all things like that. And for me, a person was black. There was no ranges of any different colorism not growing up where I, <clears throat> I lived. So I thought it was sophisticated. And I, so I wanted to use the terminology sophisticated because the sophistication comes around the policies. You make things, you kind of put a policy over it to pretend that you're really caring about what's going on regarding black people. And so that's how I started to look at that particularly. And I tested it out when I went to America, and people then jumped up and down saying they hadn't heard the word. So just a small aspect of the definition. 
What I've said is sophisticated racism is based on systematic, uh, sorry, systemic um, structures designed to promote racism, which disingenuously appearing to promote anti-racist or equitable policies. So if you, if, you, you know, if you hear what I've said there, the perpetrators would not want to be accused of racist behaviour and they pay lip service to condemning racism. Sometimes this form of racism is unconscious and subconscious. So I think that kind of a little bit sums it up, but the whole chapter is really kind of unpacking what it is when I'm using the word sophisticated. So I hope that gives you a, a little taste of anyway. Now, Carol, I know you've written extensively on language. So would you tell us a bit about the implications of the language style of black women for education and work? Um, and you discuss this in chapter four. Yes. Um, interestingly, as well, you'll find that many books that have been written on race don't pay any attention to the language issue. Um, which is interesting because the language issue is key to the interplay of sophisticated racism, quote unquote. So what I talk about is the stylistic features of blacks in the diaspora and obviously Africans, primarily West Africa, because that's where blacks from the diaspora primarily came from. So I talk about issues such as, for example, the call and response. I talk about, within education, how the body language, for example, of black pupils can often be seen as confrontational, is seen as aggressive. I talk about kissing teeth. Um, Rickford and Rickford call it sucking teeth, um, which primarily comes from West Africa. So I talk about that and how pupils are excluded. Um, in fact, there was one study that was done very recently um, by the BBC that documented that pupils that teeth sucking, or kissing teeth, um, are excluded from school, so I talk about that as well. Um, I talk about the debating styles and the differences between blacks and whites, and I know I'm using these pejorative terms. I draw on Coachman's work, which talks about the black style, and it's talking about America, but I contextualize it within the British context. The debating style which is passionate and intense, etc., and how that is interpreted. I also talk about women. Um, I drew reference to Shorter Gooden's work. Um, again, a lot of the scholars tend to come from America, so I draw on their work, and I focus on how black women themselves perceive their use of language and how they adapt their language accordingly and code switch. So they would, Shorter Gooden talks about talking black and then talking white and then crossing borders and then role flexing. Role flexing, for example, is where not just in the language itself, but even in the dress, you can see I'm dressed up tonight, I'm doing a little bit of role flexing. Um, because remember, dress is also about communicating something. So she talks about how black women carry themselves, their deportment, and how within the context of the workplace, some choose not to talk about racism or issues to do with race, and they downplay those discussions if they come up. She talks about how others tend to perhaps become more muted. They modulate their voice um, and they speak differently accordingly. Um, and that's where they cross borders, crossing from one cultural context to another. I mean, it's absolutely fascinating. And for me, the language is fascinating. Um, and to summarize, um, I 
focus on the um, women that have come over from continental Africa and the professional women, for example, because we've had a huge migration of women from Africa and how what they how they have used language so for example in most black cultures around the world based on my own studies as well there is this notion of privacy not telling individuals your personal business that's the word not telling individuals your business um interestingly i had to give a, a lecture to uh staff at academic staff at Sheffield University. So I talk about that and my experiences there and that whole notion of privacy, that can be challenging when you are dealing within the, say, a social work context where you're expected to be open. And so say, for example, you're the social worker and you think, let's say Liz is supposed to, you know, that's her private business. But you as a social worker, as a black social worker, is expected still to probe Liz on her private business. Am I making sense, everyone? And unfortunately, black female trainee social workers have actually um, found themselves, I don't use the word failing, but borderline failing courses because of their cultural way of being. And there isn't really anyone to help them to cross borders and to navigate the system. So I talk extensively about the school context and the work context and how language is used in both situations. So there are clearly challenges that black women experience, not only in terms of their language style, but there are specific challenges that hinder the success of some black women. Um, and how's that tackled in chapter five? Okay. Um, there are a number of challenges, but just to summarize the key ones, there are challenges at work, challenges within education, um, even when black women, they're supposed to be the highest participants in terms of higher education, but unfortunately, the dropout rate is um, that they've got a high, higher dropout rate for a number of reasons that we go in, into in the book. Also, in terms of, um, I talk, or we talk about this whole notion of parenting and how that has been a huge challenge for black women in particular. If we look at the figures for black young men who were in the youth offending institutions, 25% um, of black young men are in these young offending units, and we're only 3%, 25% as a raw figure. So that's a challenge for, for <coughs> black mothers. Schooling, the, there's a whole scholarly work on the so-called underachievement of black children, starting with Bernard Cord's work, um, and it goes on and on. So that is a challenge. Um, the challenge, which Victoria will talk about, of higher education for black ac female academics like ourselves. We've had several challenges, some that have been documented, others that have been undocumented. Um, the, challenges again even for those african quote unquote women that have come over in the 50s and 60s for example there was um this a lot of them fostered their children um to white parents in devon your neck of the woods and unfortunately um that was really problematic because unfortunately a few parents lost their child. Um, so there were a number, the Windrush generation had huge challenges documented again in The Heart of the Race by um, Beverly Bryan and co. 
So again, the challenges have been very intense and, and, and wide ranging. So I've touched upon a few. Okay. But also, if I just add, um, yeah. add to that as well, I mean, my, my whole of my doctoral thesis was looking mm. at unemployed mm. black women. And I don't think anybody's done that. Yeah. They don't look at unemployed black women at all because they have this myth that black women are employed mm. and it's just a myth. There's a lot of um, black women which are unemployed and also just That's skating on the, on the, on lower, the level. lower level mm. of not being able to get above yeah. where they need to be. So um, I talk about that. And yeah. My first book was, my well, second book was about that. Mm. So um, moving on to chapter six, Victoria, some of your research centres on black British young women and the notion of suffering in silence. In what ways do their experiences counter the narrative of the strong black woman? Yeah, I, I think this was, this um, chapter I put together when I was looking at um, well-being and it's about young black women and um, it's about this myth that they are not understood in school at all. And so um, I was, I suppose this came about um, where one of the politicians was doing a conference and they, and they couldn't get the funding, it was just the Conservative government that's just come in. And so I said, look, come to where we are and I'll help and I gave the room. And um, the politician was very much involved with um, the conference for black, girls and boys, you know, for education, black stuff. And, um, and so she, I was asked if I'd like to speak about my research. So I wasn't, I, I'm not, I don't like to come forward that much, but I did do it and I spent a couple of seconds and I spoke about the research and I said that it was, um, it's a, it, I called it suffering in silence, where black women, black girls were suffering in silence. And they were suffering because they kind of had this inbuilt um, kind of thinking that it's, you've got to keep strong, you've got to be resilient, you're not to show any emotions or anything like that. And, and I said, but at the same time, they're also struggling, and they're struggling with all different things. They're also getting ex excluded from school at quite high rates, which is mis mi uh, being misinterpreted because it's all about the boys. Um, and um, so there's no, not, there was very little research on black girls. And so <coughs> I was invited to, um, to the House of Commons. And at the House of Commons, from there, um, where I thought there was only like a small table like this here, there was about 400 people plus who turned up mm -hmm. to hear what was said. Mm -hmm. and, and, and there was young people in the room, there was teachers in the mm -hmm. room, there were policy people in the room, there was parents in the room, and they all said the same thing, that this is something which had been uncovered and no one's really talking about it. I have been an outsider in many ways because I'm always talking about what's going on with black girls and what's going on with black women. Because yes, there's a lot of research which is being done on boys and yes, there's a, no, there's a need. But if we don't get the discussion going on with the girls, we are in trouble. And so this chapter really talks about that. It talks about some of the work I did with focus groups in schools and really got them talking about some of the things which they haven't spoken about because they haven't been given permission to talk about how they're being um, adult ad adification yeah. towards yeah. them, what's happening. Because our girls, black girls, are not seen as little girls for very long. They have a very small girlhood. So up to age of about 10, they're seen as little girls. After that, they're seen as women. And that's the difference. And um, so this is the type of stuff which is um, mentioned in the chapter, but it's ongoing. The whole book's ongoing. I've just done another chapter out of another part of the book, which I've written and rewritten in a different way. But it's an ongoing, it's evolving. Because if you think about this, if you read this chapter, Suffering in Silence, and then think about Child Q and C and B and the whole range of other young girls which are black and they're being, um, you know, brutalised because of what's gone on. Um, this, this chapter helps you to kind of understand that this is something which is not a tiny story, it's, it's, it's continuum. So that's, that's how that came about, in that itself. So both yourself, Victoria, and Professor Ivani Mailer reflect on being black in the academy. So how do the, 
How, do, how do the critical incidents documented in Chapter 7 portray the experiences of black women in yeah. these spaces? I'm laughing. <laughs> so because we are laughing. Yeah, we're laughing. Because um, uh, being black and coming from Somerset and Devon uh, has its uh, interesting sides to it, as you say, so it's. And um, it was a rather... Um, and, Chal and Giovanni's a good friend. So it was a, it was a challenging paper to write yeah. but it was my idea and I wanted to do it and so we we spent a good three years in torturous writing backwards and forwards even being in Jamaica together and a whole range of different things and um, really understanding what was going on now I was okay I understood a lot what was going on <laughs> but my colleague found the, the uh, blackness was more, blackness was more of a narrowed concept of blackness well, I, mine was very kind of, so I, there was discussions about being white and black and being black and black. And so these came out in the incidences which we gave as well. So she'd give some incidences and we wrote about them and I gave some. So, and, and then we had conversations. We had a, there was a big piece of conversation which I took out of the chapter, because there's just not enough room, where we were doing this and we were being interviewed within a concept about, so why, how did you talk about that incident and why did I talk about this incident? Yeah. But it is a really interesting um, uh, chapter. Um, yeah. Whereas she might talk about the fact, um, um, Yvani might talk about the, uh, one of her instances when she was mistaken by um, going into a school and the school, as a, as a professor, they automatically thought that she was there, you know, for the student, you know, because I was a mother, yeah. because they thought that she was going to pick up her troubled son as against not being the professor coming to do the research and wanting to see the head teacher. So she talks about that. Whereas I talk about other ones which are more sophisticated. Yeah. Um, I'm not saying hers isn't sophisticated, yeah. but mine's more sophisticated. Hers is more blatant. Mine is more sophisticated. It's kind of hard to understand. So what, what's going on there? So I talk about an experience where I was um, taken on to lead a, a white team, and I was the leader, and how that in itself played out, um, which yeah. was in itself a, 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 an incident you know, of discussion. So that's the types of things which we've got in here. And it's real. It's real. Mm. Because we don't want people to think, well, you know, if you, once you've got into, and into the academy, now I'm at a Russell group, she's not at a Russell group, what does that look like? We want it to feel that this is an experience which is still evolving. Still evolving. We still get the lots of things which people say and what we're doing in here. But we also, of course, all of this is theorised. So we use a mixture of... Um, whiteness theory, intersectionality, critical race theory, all three of those to bring together what we're doing in this particular chapter. Like I said, I've cut some of that chapter because it was I didn't want to put it all in there. We put it up somewhere else. So now chapter eight. Yes. Flip the mm. script and change the narrative. That's a great title. Yes. It's provide strategies in managing sophisticated and everyday racism. Can you tell us about a few of the key strategies that the reader can utilise to manage sophisticated and everyday racism? Yeah, that was a good one, wasn't oh, it? Yes, I it mean, was. yeah, flip the script and change, change the narrative. Because we thought, you know, we've given you a whole load of stuff. Yeah. And now what can we, what can we do? Let's, let's take away this. So really, it was about what can we do as, what can you do as a person and what can we do as individuals? So we gave you um, five things. One is questioning. I won't go through all of them, but I'll just tell you the five. Questioning and what that meant. Because many times we recognize that many people don't question. They just take it and get angry. But question, caring, look after yourself. Because a lot of it, once you're starting to get involved or you start to experience what we're talking about, you need to take care. So there's, there's um, bullet points under that. And also behaving so you get empowerment. So empowerment comes out of it as well. You start to look at it um, and you work out What's the best way of doing this? Um, advocating. Advocating was another strategy we used. And the other one was documenting, which, again, people forget how to, what to actually do around documenting. So we did all of those, but each one, you unpack each one. We've unpacked each of those in there. And then, um, so the flip the script, what we've done, which I think is unique is to the book, is we provide small narratives and those narratives, you can then work out, okay, so how did, how did they use 
what do they do to get to where they want in that particular one? And so we've given about five narratives. And you can then work out whether I used documenting, whether we used um, questioning and documenting, whether it was advocate, all different things like that. And that's why it is quite an interactive book, but at the same time, it's not just it's not a journalistic book. Mm. It mm. is grounded in um, theory. So, but it's a but it's a really that, and that chapter is a really good book. And then of course you've got the conclusion, which looks at um, a whole range of different things. What I would like is just if, to ask you to spend just a little bit of time on the conclusions. Is there something you'd like to point out from the conclusions? Yes. Um, I think what the book attempted to demonstrate was unfortunately the stereotypes that black women encounter um, and how to be their authentic selves. Um, because often, and we spent a lot of time on identity, I think the book is a book that says, this is our experience. And we both are in the academy, so we know, for example. Um, but depend, you know, no matter what profession or job you do, um, it is a book, I feel, that can resonate with everyone, um, particularly, obviously, black females. Um, and there was actually a sentence that I'd like to read because I didn't memorise this particular sentence. We one? hope that this book has provided a light in the dark shadows by equipping black women and the wider community of colour with some of the strategies to manage sophisticated and everyday racism. And that's... I hope the takeaway from the book. Yeah, I, I think yeah, and I'd just like to add one thing as well. We mm -hmm. go back to the beginning. Yeah. So you go back to the beginning of the book, and there's the portraits, yeah. and one of the portraits there's a sentence which is fundamental to one of the reasons why I was motivated as well, which is it's it, we had a conversation after that sentence, and the sentence said, to me, you don't know what it's like to be black. And so that's what I was, that's what was suggested to me. And we had a conversation about that, didn't we? Yeah. We had an interview on that um, between myself and, and, and colleague. And um, yeah, so that, that's, that's a thread. So it fits back to what Carol said, but it's a thread. So yeah, so that's, yeah. that's the baby. And, and also you, you have to mention the black, the black swan. swan. There's a black swan. And there's a reason for that as oh. well. Definitely a reason. Do you want to just tell the reason a little? Oh right, okay. okay. Well, it's. I mean, it's for me. It's. It, I mean, I. I live by the um, Epi, and there's a black. I see black swans, but it also represents black women. Yeah. On, it's it's is a calm sea there, which is the murkiness. The murkiness is the sophistication, and then you've got either side. You've got the heels, and so there's the swan sitting on there. This calmness, but it's not calm. It's sophisticated racism. And then you've got the sides. But yes, there's another story too, but I haven't got time to tell that. Okay. <laughs> well, there'll perhaps be time afterwards um, to, to explore it further. But can we say a big thank you for just really answering all those questions so fully?